Hello, welcome back. It's week 76 on Out on That Line. I'm Jeff with my co-host Alex. As always, Alex, how you doing this week? Jeff, I am in my lane, I am moisturized, and I am thriving. I'm ready to do this. That's it, it just what a renaissance, man. Your skin is an organ, Jeff. You got to take care of it. You know, you work out to keep your heart healthy. You got to take care of that skin, baby. It's true. But we have some things this week to talk about. And being a music podcast, we're going to talk about some music that we've both recently seen. We're also going to discuss something that pisses me the hell off. And we've got an album to talk about as well. Uh, so we're going to get to all of that first. Alex, why don't you tell us why you're a little tuckered out today? Well, I attended a concert in fair Boston with friend of the show, Tanner. Mm-hmm. And I did not get home until four in the morning. What a party animal. It was a fantastic experience. I saw the band Prep. Prep is a band that, and this is the story that we got to end up telling the band, was mm-hmm. the algorithm on Spotify just fed me Prep one day. I'm like, I really like the song. I threw it on a playlist. Next thing I knew, I was in the record store, randomly was sorting through stuff, found that album, and went, no shit. This must be a sign. Bought it, went home, crushed it a bunch of times, put it on out at camp. Tanner walks in, immediately pings. We had found our generation's Steely Dan. If you like Steely mm-hmm. Dan, you know that is not something to be taken lightly. Well, I I don't like Steely Dan. So exactly. why don't you tell, tell the folks a little bit more <laughs> about why that comparison came up for you? Oh, it's just like studio perfectionism and craftsmanship and like the ultra mm-hmm. smooth borrowing from Michael McDonald. Tanner and I are big Yacht Rock guys. Mm-hmm. So it, they prep describes themselves as Marina Pop. I got a big okay. I got a big old Woody for these people that invent their own genre. Illuminati mm-hmm. Hotties with Tender Punk, Prep with Marina Pop. It's good stuff cuz they're doing Those are great names too. They're fantastic. They're doing some yeah. weird shit. So uh, Prep is smooth, it takes really g- interesting chances. It's mm-hmm. danceable. It's uh it's perfect. It's perfect. So we had a great time seeing them down at the Middle East nightclub in Boston. Uh, place is a fucking dump. I hate it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a fucking shithole. <laughs> the people that worked there were very cool, but they literally had a portion of the wall that had foam stuffed in it, duct tape over mm-hmm. it, spray painted to match the color of the wall. I almost put my hand yep. through it. Yep. So That sounds, sounds about right. Big time hole in the wall piece of shit, which kind of yeah. makes it more fun. Especially to see someone like Prep because they've got this very like laid back, like dad's floating on a boat kind of aesthetic to them. Mm-hmm. Open shirts and pastels and stuff like that. They're so chill. The lead singer's just bopping around with no expression on his face, which sounds fucking awful. But it's amazing because the music is so fucking good. It's perfect summer music too, folks, as we okay. wind our way into summer. Uh, do, do they have just the one album? They have just the one album, and then they have like a collection of singles, and then they have a bunch of EPs. Okay. There's well, a lot. Go check them out. The band is Prep, and apparently play a pretty damn good live show. Absolutely. And we got to meet yeah. them afterwards and have an extended conversation with them, and they're very British and very cool. They're British. They're British. Well, that changes everything. Yeah, well, one of them's Welsh. His name's <laughs> Llewellyn. Okay, well, that's kind of... I feel like I've never met a Welsh person. Neither had person I before. until last night. Wow. His name's like Llewellyn Gwynfiddich or something. I don't know. They're weird made-up language that they have. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing someone like speak... Is it called Welsh? Like, is it just speaking Welsh? Or is I there... think so. Okay, yeah. So someone speaking Welsh, it sounds very strange. It sounds like somebody trying to speak like in a scottish accent yeah oh yeah but they can't do it <laughs> they have like no vowels in anything it's all like green it's like meant to be said with the corners of your mouth sealed green min filled in like r's and f's and y's and d's all over the place it's like unpronounceable and yet they can just rattle it off to you and it sounds mellifluous what a word. The damnedest thing. Fucking $10 word. You like that? Jesus. Yeah. You like that? 
Oh, after we just pissed off all of our Welsh fans. Absolutely. Yeah. Apologies sure to Llewellyn. There's... He's a cool dude. <laughs> well, anything else you want to recap about your, your evening with, with prep? No, I've gone on to quite a clip. I'll pass the baton to you. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, fun fact about the Middle East. Uh, that was the bar that Tanner and I were at uh, watching, I think, a Patriots-Broncos playoff game when Peyton Manning was playing for them. Um, the bartender was clearly pouring doubles. Like when we were just ordering, my standard was just, you know, shot in a beer. Whenever I needed a new beer, I just ordered a new shot too. And was clearly pouring doubles. And so I don't know how many of those I had, but that was also the night that we had the worst pizza that I've ever had in my life. Oh, the legendary story. Yeah. My friend, my friend, we're open. I was like, I wish he had never said that. Because the only thing I remember from that night after the Middle East was trying some of that pizza, being like, this is disgusting. And how bad does pizza need to be for someone that's blacked out at like 1.30 in the morning in Boston? <laughs> like, how bad does that pizza need to be for them to not even want it? That's an excellent point. Yeah, there was a, we found the pizza the next morning and there was like two bites taken out of it total. Who knows how much we paid for that pizza? Yeah. $50 <laughs> cash out the door. Yeah. I have no idea. No idea. But it was disgusting. That's Ugh. all I remember. Yeah. Middle East making memories. Look at that. Yep. They last a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the distinct pleasure of seeing Chris Tone Kingfish Ingram at a uh, ACL live taping. So, um, fiance of the pod marla's cousin john had tickets that he gave us because he had i think some other event that he had came up um, and he couldn't make it to the show so marla and i went and we ended up sitting like second row like right on the aisle closest to the stage like really close and i had listened to some kingfish before uh, but never had really gone to see like a, a really good live blues player other than Gary Clark Jr. And at that show, it was like probably four years ago. And I was like really sick that night and like tried to make it through, but just couldn't. So I couldn't really appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, so I'd never really seen like a guitar wizard other than Claudio Sanchez, of course, like play like that live and seeing Kingfish and what he was able to do on a guitar was just un fucking real. At one point he like came down off the stage and was just playing guitar in the aisle. Like he had the wireless connection thing for his, his amp. Um, just stood like it was three feet, four feet from me for like 45 seconds or a minute or something seemed like forever just playing along like i'm just standing watching him do that just watching him play these things on guitar that i'd never seen anything like that live before i mean he played a, a cover of hey joe by hendrix and i felt like i was watching Jimi hendrix he just like played it so perfectly like even down to the solo the way he sounds like he's got a very like very deep voice like very deep baritone he's from like mississippi somewhere um he's kind of short quite wide in stature i don't know if you've seen any pictures of him but just like watching him play guitar it's just like somebody totally nondescript just like surprises you more than anything and it was an incredible show he was an incredible guitar player and i will absolutely go see that guy again if i, I get a chance to i saw marla's instagram story and i'm like wow that guy's must be is he like some friend of theirs or something that's how close you guys were yeah, because he just starts walking up, and I'm like, "Oh, this must be some friend who got them tickets or something." I'm like, "Oh, oh shit, no! Listen to this guy shred out of his mind. That was crazy. That's really cool yeah. that you guys got to do that." Yeah, that was it. Was one of the best concert experiences I think I've ever had. I mean, I've never been well, other than Meatloaf, I guess. I've never been like that close to like the front row. I think maybe at against me a couple times, I've like got a few rows from the front row, but like not where they're playing directly in front of me where I'm like within arm's length. You know what I mean? Like it was just, it was so cool. And he was so fucking good. So uh, fucking good. Had you ever been a part of a taping before? Um, so we saw Mitski oh. there 
for her ACL live taping. Ah. Oh. <laughs> she basically, I'm going to be honest with you, she basically just like had sex with the stage the whole time. You know that's a thing? It's called, I guess, bu- yeah. It's called buto, and you basically are expressing emotions through like manic sexualized dancing. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know what else to call it. That sounds pretty accurate. Bet you didn't know I knew I that, did you? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you knew that, but I'm also not surprised. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> See also, Shibari. Um, oh, my God. What else? I know there's more. I know you got more. Uh, no, I'm topped out on, like, cool japanese stuff mm. oh you're like a you're like a kinky thesaurus i think kinky thesaurus is an amazing band name <laughs> holy right. shit i gotta write that down that's fucking <laughs> bananas good wow zach if you're listening you know that's the one buddy like you know that's the one. <laughs> oh, you guys still haven't settled on a name no the closest we got was reasonably decent people. Okay. And we all like it. Zach is afraid I'm giving away insider. They're going to be like, what are you fucking doing? No, let's hear it. Let's get the tea. Spill it, baby. Yeah. Hey, you guys are sharing the songs with the rough demos with everybody. So let me take you through the naming process. We all throw stuff out here and there. Usually the best we get is two people looking at each other being like, you know, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Rory and I wing the very stupid ones like Howard's Friendly Market. Reasonably decent people came from us. Oh man, Howard's Friendly Market would be so good. It's it's great. I don't think Tanner likes it. We've brought it up to him in the past. And then you have to have a song called Tiny Carts. <laughs> Tiny little half goats. <laughs> yeah. One, two, three. Oh, <laughs> uh, like and oh man, in another song called the Dis- the display of Ben and Jerry's factory seconds. Oh yo, Howard's friendly market used to be the shit. Used to be the shit. They'd always have the cookies at the back. Ooh, cookies at Those, the like, back. Those like sugar cookies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what? Oh, I-, I remember. Like I have like deep seated memories of Howard's friendly market. You're. Correct, man. I may need to just write a love ballad to Howard's Friendly Market. <laughs> and just show up and just slap it down and be like, here you go. They guys. all had the blue aprons. Oh. All the cashiers. And the little the penny dispenser was like a, when they got the electronic one that would like just automatically shoot out your change into the little tray. Plus they had their crazy logo. Like yep. there was a Howard to put to the to the name. And it was yep. his friendly market. So, like, Rory and I love Howard's Friendly Market. We're big on that one. We love the goofy shit. Um, and then Zach and Tanner fall a little more on the, like, people won't laugh when they see it on the poster end of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's a total crapshoot. Usually no more than two people agree. <laughs> Reasonably decent people kind of got a little bit of a head tilt from all four of us. But I don't think okay. any one of us is sold on it. Yeah, I feel like I think it'd be a good one, especially if it's going to be like indie music. Right, which it is. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's I think that's a pretty good one. But is it Kinky Thesaurus? I, buddy, I got to tell you, reasonably <laughs> decent people got kicked all the way down the stairs in favor of Kinky Thesaurus. <laughs> that is a fucking guaranteed platinum nuclear option band name. <laughs> Holy fuck. That's amazing. Because I also wanted to call the band Shibari. (laughs) (laughs) Do people know what that is? Do I have to explain it? I won't explain it. They can Google it. Just tell tell the people. You can cut it if you feel like it. But oh, I'm fine with telling everybody. It's a Japanese rope bondage fetish where it's like really interesting knots, like arranged very interestingly on the body. Uh huh. Kind of make like a little beautiful human pot roast. You know. I'll trust up. So I think I think you'd be safe with that. And let me tell you why. Because the people that know what that is aren't going to want anyone else to know that they know what that is. That's a v- very good point. There's a certain amount of artistry to it. Learning all of those knots, you know, that ain't easy. That takes time and dedication. Yeah. So the people that are it into it are cool. into it. It sounds cool. It sounds cool. And if word gets out about what it is, it'll be like, oh, my God, they're so weird and interesting. They're so edgy. Yeah. 
I don't know. I was in favor. Nobody else wanted it. Shibari. Well, you should have told them it meant something else. Probably. Because if you had said it meant something else, who was going to check? It means benevolent hamster. <laughs> There's another good one. I did a spit take. <laughs> benevolent hamster is a good secondary yeah. one. Zach, are you keeping track of these? Man, we are just off on a whole <laughs> fucking topic we did not think we were going to. Well, listen, we said we were going to go just where the episode takes us. It's very you know? true. I felt, like, I felt like my hand was getting held and pulled in a certain direction, and I had a lot of fun. I, I, I did time with that. I have no regrets. Yeah. It's a good little segment. Yeah, take notes, friendly listeners. That was that was fun, and I hope you had as much fun as we did. Yeah, we had a good time. Yeah. Well, we still have an album to talk about, but there's still there's still the news that Coheed and Cambria pushed back their album release from later this month in May to now about a month later in June. And this is because of the supply train supply chain shortages. So they have um they always like Coheed quick rundown you know they're very nerdy band there's comic books and graphic novels that go along with the whole thing they release like action figures collectibles like it's a whole thing um part of this release is like a special edition box set that has like a mask in it you know just certain like coheed and cambria specific items you know and, and membership to like the fan club for the year um, gets you like a little black card that gives you early access to the shows and things like that. So I have mine pre-ordered. And then they also do a special edition for the first release of the vinyl for every album that they do, at least like the last probably six or seven albums or so. Um, and so there's delays with that as well. So they've pushed the complete album release back to that point and, and people are pissed because there's a lot of people that are like, I pre-ordered the digital copy. Like, if it's ready and it's only like the vinyl and the box sets that are holding it back, like why can't I get my copy of the album when you said you were going to release it? And, you know, I'm obviously on the other side where I've, I've like waited for Coheed albums forever. You know, it pisses me off that I got to wait longer for this one, especially because I ponied up like probably close to 200 bucks for, for the box set and the special edition vinyl and shipping and all that kind of stuff that goes along, goes along with it. Um, so I'm like a little pissed about that, but I also like know you little fuckers that only spent $10 on the digital album or $15, what it is like, no, yeah, they're going to wait for us to get our copies. Cause we paid them more money. So obviously that's the way it was going to go. Wow, Jeff, the one percenter. I never yeah, thought you're I'd see. Goddamn it. right. Whoa. You're goddamn right. When I pay for convenience and I pay for things in premiums, I expect to get them. <sighs> that was a passionate argument because I got to be honest, I was on the other side when this started. I was like, hey, man, that's not cool to say that the people who pay for the, the big shit are more important than the other fans. That's not cool. But you've completely well. swayed me. I believe in billionaires now. <laughs> well, I mean, when it comes to like something as like extraneous as getting music from a band, you know what I mean? It's not like we're talking about basic, you know, human needs here. Well, and the other thing is it's, it's like, not it's not you're not being prioritized. You guys don't get it exclusively and they don't. Y'all get it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it's just pushing it back so that people that ordered yo the album and everything get to enjoy it for the first time when they get the physical copy in their hands because that's where you know like streaming hasn't been around as long as coheed has you know so it's like that's how people that really have loved the band forever and the kind of people that are going to spend the money on box sets and vinyls and you know hoodies and like i don't even know how many different coheed shirts i have from concerts i've seen them at you know what i mean like i've spent a lot of money Plus buying all the graphic novels that go along with everything in the box set for the last album they came out with. Like I spent a lot of money on this stuff and it's because it's a band I love. So I think they're looking at that and like, which part of the fan base are we going to piss off? Cause if we do the, the digital release first, we're going to piss off the people that are willing to spend the money on 
all the other stuff that we make way more money from versus like a couple dollars maybe from each sale. If it's that, I doubt it's even that much for a sale of an album online. They're like, we probably make a ton more money from this other stuff. So we're going to go ahead and make sure that they get their album first. Well, you've swayed me because that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. So it's about loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. Fuck those other peons who were too yeah. <laughs> didn't want to pony up for an experience. I was yeah, on your exactly. side. Exactly. We were rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. Now, what really would have pissed me off is if they pushed the release back past the date of the show that I'm seeing them at in July. Mm. Because that little black card gets me early access to go in there and hear, like, get closer to the front. And also they play like an acoustic cover song. Hmm. And that's just kind of what they've always done for the people that get in early that have that black card or paid for the the higher end tickets for that particular show. And so this past tour, it was Love Gun by Kiss that they would play. <laughs> so it's like that's the kind of thing that you pay that extra money for is so you get those extra little experiences. A little perk, like hearing a Kiss song. Yeah. <laughs> well, hearing Kohe play a Kiss song. <laughs> For us, for us heed heads, you know, as children of the fence, hearing Coheed do anything is the greatest thing in the world. Is that what you're called? Children of the fence? Yeah. Jeff, are you sure this isn't an offshoot of Nexium cult? <laughs> well, it might be a cult. The way the Facebook group reacts to certain things, it might be a cult for sure. Have you taken a brand? Has someone poked I you with not. a hot iron? I, I have not. Okay. I have not. Uh, nowhere that I can see anyway. Okay. All right. We're yeah. safe for now. <laughs> well, I want you to keep your head on a swivel at that concert. These children of the fence, as you call them, they don't sound like nice boys, girls, and envies. So let's... Oh, but see, I'm I'm one of them. So the outsiders are who needs to worry about it. <laughs> Just see you beating the <laughs> shit out of people at a going concert. <laughs> I've never seen you here before. <laughs> Just right as soon as they, they hit the big chorus in Gravity's Union. Just going to start. We'll pick out the non-believers. Just start raining blows. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you say we get into the album that we have yet to talk about that we have this week? Correct. Uh, this was a suggestion from, drumroll please, you'll never guess, it's Tanner. So thank you, Tanner, for the suggestion. The band is letting up despite great faults. And the album is four, the Roman numeral four. I don't know if they mean it as IV or four, but I read that as four. I also read it as four. And can I be honest, as long as we're talking about band names, I would have mm -hmm. flipped what they've got. I would have made their band name the name of the album, and I would have named the group four. That would have been a good call. The band name is a fucking a mouthful. And like something yes. that has a rhythm with it, like Dragon New Warm Mountain, I Believe in You for the album title for Big Thief. Yeah. That's got a rhythm to it. It's almost like iambic Does pentameter. It? Does it? Dragon New Warm Mountain, I Believe in You. It, it feels natural to me. Now I did practice it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think like four would be a badass band name. And especially when you spell it with the Roman numerals, like that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's going to show up in like the very first section of all the CDs and the vinyls. Like that's going to be, that's like the weird section. Yeah. Everybody always sees the ends. I, I, I Yeah, I wish they had consulted me on this, you know. But they Well, I, maybe I could go see them. They're based out of Austin. That's very true. They are. So yeah, maybe I could just go see them and be like, look, you guys really fucked up. It's not I'm too not late just to some guy. This. Yeah, I'm not just some guy. So let me tell you how this is going to go. Sit down. Have a seat. You guys have anything to eat? Who doesn't put out a coffee cake? What is this? What is this third-rate <laughs> dog and pony show? Where's the pizza? Well, well so they their album uh, released March 4th, 2022. So just a couple of months old since that one was birthed. Um it was, you know, it's a very, I guess you would probably assume just from the, the name of the band letting up, dis, 
despite great faults and the the album cover as well it's like someone diving into the water a couple people lounging in like little kayaks you know very soothing sort of scene that they set there i think you can obviously assume this is going to be some sort of indie pop music kind of just really leads itself to believe that and then you see that they're from austin and that's pretty much all is coming out of austin these days so it makes sense that it is in fact indie pop and it is so indie pop that it is sometimes difficult to pick certain things out on this album that's kind of my one overarching i don't i don't know if i want to say criticism or just observation about the album i guess criticism because we're going to get into it more but and i can explain more what i mean Uh, but yeah it just seemed like a lot of the same thing all the way through the end that's that's a fair observation and that was the difficult thing about discussing this album we talked and we're like I can't for the life of me pick three songs out of this because I'll jump to my like spoilers on the style. I I like it. I like shoegaze. Mm -hmm. I like indie pop. I like that kind of like dream pop kind of stuff. It didn't go like if you love Beach House and I do. It it doesn't go like full Beach House. It never goes quite that far. It reminds Mm me uh, more of something like Sufjan Stevens. Like Sufjan Stevens is a vibe. I don't particularly love sitting and really listening to a Sufjan Stevens album, mm-hmm. but it's a great soundtrack to activities. It's a great act- yeah. soundtrack to a feeling. That's kind of what this is. It's a soundtrack to a feeling, which doesn't allow for a ton of variation. So while it's good, it makes it really fucking difficult to talk about. Yes. And I think so. The first, the way the first song, like the instrumental, the intro song, went i was like man i'm gonna really i'm gonna really like this because it was very like electronic i thought we were about to get like a straight up just lo-fi all the way through kind of album and i was like i I can get into that you know i could really you know usually i've been listening to much more aggressive faster harder stuff lately but it's like sometimes you need to break from that and so i'll throw on a podcast or a little bit lighter listening i'll throw on some like sturgill or something like that but i was immediately i was like oh man maybe this is an album i can add to that sort of rotation have something else to listen to when i want to take a break and cool out for a minute and then the rest after that first song the rest of the album wasn't really like that at all so i was like a little bit disappointed with that but not in the music itself it just it seemed like because i love death cap for cutie and it seemed like at certain points this had that same kind of vibe where it was like definitely everything was just kind of sitting on the upper register a little more jangly a little more chimey so like the mood the vibe was definitely a like a very summer kind of feeling Mm -hmm. like you're it's a nice day outside nice cool breeze like that's it kind of evoked an emotion which is i think a strength of having everything be some somewhat similar is you're able to keep that emotion for longer you're not sending you you know on this roller coaster which i personally prefer that in albums which you know having a little bit more dynamicism in the emotions of the album but sometimes it works when you just keep one flat even keel all the way through and i think for them it works a little better than it does for a lot of other bands that were to try it yeah no i agree that like it, they do. They just hold steady, and it's not. It's also not that big of a thinker, which allows you like you have to feel it because they're not offering you a lot of profundity, and that's not a dig, but it's just not one of the more challenging albums we've we've gone through. Um, but it maintains that steady buzz, and it, that's how you understand the album is just like, oh, it's this feeling like you say stretched out so that you don't get whiplash. So it's cool. It's not taking a ton of chances, but it's like very well done. It's very well crafted. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think um, there's a couple like interesting moments on this. So I want to say, and it's hard to like pick it up, but I think it's from like tumble going into curl or maybe curl going into self portrait, but there's like a, a weird, almost like breakdown just a very different sound than than appears on the rest of the album. I think it maybe is just curl. I think it's just the instrumental. Um, but 
the first instrumental, the first song on the album. And that to me, I think were the most interesting parts on the album. Cause I was like, this is a much different sort of style, a much different sort of mood than you have on the rest of the album. And the way that it only really happened like twice in the whole thing, I was like, what's the reason for this? Is this supposed to be like, you know, meaningful to an overall story? And I couldn't really ever figure it out, but maybe I was like, it doesn't really matter if it did because I, the fact that it got me back interested in everything in the way that it was going, I was like, well, they put it in the right spot because it brought me kind of back into everything, made me realize that, oh, I've been listening. It's been different songs, even though they have like similarities as they carry on through. So I feel like maybe it's supposed to feel a little bit like it's bleeding into each other. Um, when you get to those points where it like breaks you out, it's like, okay, think about what you've seen for a little bit. We're going to do something a little different here, a little intermission, and then we're going to get you back into it. And it just seemed like instead of it being like a roller coaster, it just like pulled off to the side of the road for you for a second, allowed you to collect yourself and then get back on the road. Yeah. And that's, that's a good way of putting it. That's a good metaphor because again, it's just so, it's so difficult to talk specifics because whatever you say about one thing, you're saying about the whole thing, the way that it's constructed and it's very, I mean, it's total shoegaze, like obviously getting its name from the way you dance to the music with your little head down, staring at your little feet and your little shoes as you're dancing. (laughs) And that music is meant to be a vibe, to quote a thing we love to go back to all the time. It's not Dylan's Masters of War, but doesn't have to be. And it doesn't necessarily have to go in crazy directions. And I'm like you. I like when they throw some real variation at us, but Mm -hmm. there again, it's that emotional whiplash. I think they're just trying to prevent that, and their perspective is that kind of light, enjoyable Mm -hmm. sound. So, yeah, again, really fucking difficult to talk about specifically, but overall, I liked it. I would say stream it. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'll say stream it, especially if you like. If you like the kind of like dream pop shoegaze, like indie pop, you'll, you're absolutely going to like this a lot. I mean, this is, I mean, as, as true a representation of like those, that kind of genre as anything I've heard, it's just like not typically what I go for these days, but yeah, stream it, especially, like I said, if this is your genre of music, um, what I wish this was more like is like Mazzy star. Mm-hmm. That's great. You know, that's, I yep. felt like the same, like the instrumentation was there, but if it's, I guess just the mood, obviously in Mazzy star is a little different than they were trying to portray here, but that's like, in my opinion, like shoegaze or dream pop, like Mazzy star to me is like kind of the, the gold standard of that kind of band. I mean, it's just like, look on down from the bridge, fade yeah. into you like unbelievable songs into dust like one of the one of the most like haunting beautiful songs i think i've ever heard and it's just like that's what i wish this was more like and that's the thing is like that comparison kind of crystallizes it for me where like you really feel mazzy star on a personal level with all the songs that you named like you really feel those with your heart and soul and it's mm-hmm. tougher to do that from a more kind of chipper perspective and if it's going to be compared to something like Mazzy Star, which is Lofty Heights, that is that is a tough road to hoe. Not that I think everyone is making that comparison, but now that you mention it to me, I'm like, that is shoegaze vibe music that goes straight to your heart. And I didn't mm-hmm. feel like a personal heart-to-heart with this. I enjoyed it. It gave me a vibe, but I didn't necessarily connect with it on an extremely human, personal level. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the, that would be the only thing holding me back from a more like enthusiastic stream. It yeah, like it's it's it goes so far as if you are a fan of this genre of music, you're probably going to like this a lot. If you're not, you may not. Right, people that like that kind of thing, it's the kind of thing they like. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, how are we doing on the time here? It's a shorty. Oh, we're doing, but yeah, it's a shorty. But I mean, do you have anything else that you want to? that you want to talk about, that you want to get off your chest, that you want to throw out there? Well, first of all, I would just like to thank Frank Zappa because he almost (laughs) didn't make it in this episode again. We couldn't, we can't do it. We couldn't do this without him. 
that none of this would be possible. He made me the pretentious asshole I am today. Um, specifically because he's my entire identity and he was an asshole. So, but he could back his shit up. Me, on the other hand, total failure. Do you ever think about growing the mustache like him? I can't. I can't grow like, facial just hair. Glue, just glue one on. Well, that I would do. The Zapata mustache. I would do that. Yeah. Why not? I think you could absolutely do it. I think with my haircut and that mustache, I'd be unstoppable. If 100%. Clean cut on the top, all freak on the face. You're going to have to, well, whatever like live shows you ever do, whether it's music or comedy or whatever it is, you're going to have to keep like the front three rows empty. Can't let people sit there because, I mean, people just be getting pregnant. <laughs> That and the illusion is broken. If they see the netting on my mustache, I'm done. (laughs) Well, that's more of a lighting issue. It's true. You just got to make sure you have a good lighting tech. That's all. Don't sweat too much. Yeah. That's part of it. You got to have a good lighting tech that's not going to keep you in the high beams for too long. Right. You know, let you cool off a little bit. Yep. And conserve your energy. You don't have to dance full out for every song. Mm-hmm. As long as you're into it with your whole body, it doesn't mean you have to make crazy, big, outrageous movement. Slow down. Sell mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. That's how I feel. You have no idea how yep. badly I wish I could grow iconic facial hair. <laughs> Maybe one day it's just like just going to appear. I don't know. Everybody kept saying, well, by the time you're 26, you'll know what you're working with. And then I read, well, by the time you're 28, I'm 32 now. I have gray hairs still on have my time. head. I'd say by the time you're like 35, you'll know. God damn you. Don't keep my hopes yeah. up. <laughs> it's iconic in how shitty it is. I can grow a throat beard and sideburns, a skinchy mustache, nothing on the chin or cheeks. Well, see, the how long have you let the mustache grow out is the question. How long have you ever tried? Haven't done it in a while. Well, what was the longest that, like, how, like, a period of months? How long did you let it grow? College was the last time I tried to really let it grow. And so that's 10 years ago. And uh, it looked like shit. It, it grew for about two months. Looked awful. See, see, this, this mustache, and this is great content for the people listening to the podcast. <laughs> this mustache on my face here. It took probably a good, like, four months before it was, like, really fully in there. Does it, like, but, like, to maintain it and stuff, is it a pain in the ass? Does it still itch? No, you just ha- I just have the electric clippers and just, like, just, like, clip it down, you know? So it doesn't become no a soup deal. strainer? Yeah, no big deal. That's the annoying part. When it gets a little long, and you know it when it gets long, it's like something, you'll go to, like, take a drink and all your drink will just be in your mustache. You'll be like, yes, I'm trimming this tonight. Yep. That's what makes me decide it's time to trim is when stuff really gets stuck in there. You got gross mustache food. Yeah. I don't know. I I I I look at like the here's the thing. It grows in so quickly, like so fast and furious mm-hmm. on me. So I have to shave all the fucking time. And I just wish I could let it burst into a beautiful beard. Just let it rip. Like what better time than now, right now in your life? But am I an iconic baby face? You know what I'm saying? You never know until people yell at you to shave the mustache. I guess. I guess. I guess. The other thing is, though, when the mustache gets to a certain length, I start licking the corners of my mouth incessantly. Mm -hmm. It's like a tick that I can't quit. So I always end up like, fuck it, and I just shave it down. So you just got to keep it clear of the corners so you don't lick at it. I got to not be a fucking gecko person and lick my mouth. <laughs> yeah, you could do that too. Just stop licking it. Stop being disgusting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this I mean, we got ourselves off on two really good tangents. I think so. This week. That was that was really well done. It's the second podcast I've accomplished this week that really took a lot of visual elements and threw them in the hopper with zero payoff for them to anyone listening well they the imagination i think is most important because when you when you would read a book and then you would see the movie was the movie ever like you imagined that's it was going to be at what you read in the book it's a fair point no nope yeah your imagination was always better it's your most powerful tool yep 
That and your fists. Well, I trained thought. properly. Yes. <laughs> See, your imagination, you can just, on your own, you could sit alone in a room, and that that's the that's the only thing that you can, like, work on without working on it all. Because you sitting alone in a room for, like, five years, don't talk to anybody, your imagination is going to be better than anybody's. That Some of the guys that were um, detained in Vietnam would, like, one guy built his dream house, like, every, like, one nail at a time to keep his sanity. He just, like, built his dream house. Oh, to keep his sanity. Yes, correct. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that tells you. Okay. Well, that, that sounds you. like that was a, a tenuous hold at best. Well, you know what? As long as you <laughs> held on to it. Might have lost I a couple guess. fingernails on the way down, but you stayed in touch with yourself. <laughs> I, guess, I guess so. I'm sure it was a, a beautiful home. It was a wonderful home, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, well. Well, we've we you know we officially cracked forty five minutes, so I think sure. we're, I think we've I think we've accomplished the rules here. So our our overlords won't tell us we didn't put the work in this week. Guys, let me just be honest with you. Sometimes you you run into a weird buzzsaw with content. Was this one not as tight as other ones, especially coming hot off the heels of Alice in Chains? No, it wasn't. But the point is, we showed up. We did our work. We gave it 100%. The fault didn't lie on us. It, it fell on an album that was difficult to talk about. If you want to get mad at someone, get mad at this band that should have been named for. Or uh, get mad at Tanner. Get mad at... I was just about to say get mad at Tanner. Yeah. Get mad at Tanner. He wants to be a part of this thing. Guess what? You're going to shoulder some fucking blame. <laughs> yeah. If anyone deserves some animosity, it's it's that guy for yeah. sure. Fucking trash. Yeah. It's a trash move. Yeah, it's... So if you see Tanner in real life in public, make sure you give him like a, a purple nurple. You know, make him like scare him so he stubs his toe. You know, just something like that. I just hope I would love it if like he's at a too bad we don't have mall food courts anymore because I, it's where I envision this happening. Is he's just like eating a hamburger at a mall food court, and somebody just comes up and dumps their shake on his head and they whisper in his ear. Out on that line sends its regards. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be truly like a gift done to me. But can you, know. you can you send out this episode with the reins of Castamere? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I'll write that down. <laughs> All right. Well, make sure you go check out our YouTube page, folks. We're gonna have another reaction video out there, so it's one that's been requested a few times, and again. I'm not sure if these are all just Alex's accounts. I'm, I'm in a real, I'm in a real tenuous place in my head here, folks, when it comes to these YouTube subscribers. So it might be Alex requesting this stuff, but it's been requested. So I'm going to do it. So go to the YouTube, make sure you subscribe. So you keep up with all those videos. Cause it's not just reaction videos on there. It's also our singles videos, our full podcast episodes, just like you're listening to now. If you're listening to this on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or Anchor, any of those, Apple Podcasts, you could also just be listening to it on the YouTube, and you'd be able to see everything else while you're there as well. So make sure you go subscribe. If you've got something you want us to talk about that you listened to recently, a favorite album, anything, just tell us in our DMs out on that line on Instagram, out on that line one on Twitter. You could send us an email out on that line at gmail.com. And Alex, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? As long as I've invoked the good name of Frank Zappa, I'm clear to take off. Let's kick All this All right. Beat. Well, then let's do it. Until next time.